It's Garrett from Brains at Play. After several months of quiet development, I'm finally ready to give you a preview of VS Code, our new JavaScript framework for rapidly prototyping high-performance web applications. In this video, I'll give you a brief introduction to the framework and then show you how you can use it to develop next-generation interactive content for the web. VS Code is a high-level, zero-overhead framework that we've designed to be a natural evolution of popular tools like Scratch, Simulink, and Unreal Engine Blueprints. Unlike these systems, however, it takes full advantage of the latest ECMAScript standards to be used and extended by students, educators, and professional developers alike. Organized around the idea of a networked graph of modular application files, ES Code wraps existing web libraries and comes with an embeddable editor to allow users to build processing pipelines and education tools quickly and simply. In short, it's like a game engine capable of engulfing the entire web. In this video, we'll show you how to set up a simple ES Code project. We'll also demonstrate key features by walking you through the development of a handful of small demos. This will all culminate in the design of a complete educational tutorial about signals processing, which uses embedded editors to visualize the application and allow users to modify its behavior at runtime. All the code for this tutorial is available at the Brains at Play Starter Kit repository. Yeah. Visit the link in the description to review and download. And now, let's move on to setting up your first project with VS Code. Throughout this tutorial, we'll be using VS Code's live server extension to make project resources available to our demo page. After creating a blank HTML page with a module script tag, we'll start by importing the core ES Compose library from a remote CDN. Then, we'll create two objects to use as input. The first is ESC, which will be where we declare an ES component that is constructed by the library. The second is Properties, which will be merged with this component before it's created. After this, we can then specify the ESCompose.create function and pass in our two variables. To get something to show on our page, however, we'll need to parent the component to the document. Then, we'll specify the element key in the ESC object, which we set as H2 to create a header tag. Finally, we'll specify the attributes key with inner text set to Hello World. After saving, you'll now see Hello World displayed on the browser. We can also specify an ESC object as an ES module in its own separate file. We'll call this hello.esc.js and place it inside a new component subdirectory. We'll now copy in our header component so that it's nested inside the children property of this component file. For demonstration, we'll also add an attributes property with the padding set to 25 pixels. After saving, you'll see this hello world text has been moved into a div now with 25 pixels of padding. To show the full capabilities of VS Code though, we'll have to look at an example where two JavaScript objects need to listen and respond to each other. Let's say, for instance, that we want our header to respond to text inputted into an input tag. This problem, it turns out, is quite simple. First, we'll declare a new file called composition.esc.js. Using the compose keyword, we won't have to recreate our header, but can instead inherit it from the previous component we made. We can then specify our input tag inside the component's children, which will merge into the component declared with the compose key. Then, we we'll use the listener keyword to indicate that the header should receive updates from the input default behavior, updates to its internal state. Finally, we'll have to specify the input component inside a new ES component file. Inside the file, specify that the element should be an input tag. Then, we'll indicate using native ESM export syntax that we want the default behavior of this component to involve passing the current input value to listening components. We'll do this using a standard function declaration rather than an arrow function so that we can access instance-specific properties using the this keyword. Now the only thing we have to declare is an onInput attribute that triggers this default behavior. And we'll see that when we type into the input component, the header is updated with it. Pretty neat. Another interesting feature of ES Code is that ES components can be converted into native web components with a simple keyword definition. 
starting a new component in a new file, we can use the define keyword to register our custom header input element as a reusable web component. This simply requires us to provide a name and indicate if it extends an existing HTML element, as well as declare which US components to compose it from. After this, it's as simple as creating a new child with their element keyword equal to the name defined above, and we'll have our web component on the screen. What's more, if we define three of these components, they all remain independent of each other. Based on the properties we've already described, ES Code is positioned to accelerate development with complex APIs by abstracting their behaviors to keys on simple objects that respond to arbitrary listener inputs. For instance, let's take the Phaser 3 API for web-based game development. We've already created a handful of relevant ES components that can be found in our starter kit repository, linked in the description. We're going to copy them here, as well as the base ES component that initializes a game with a single player. Adding another player is as simple as defining another child, let's call it companion, and specifying its properties to distinguish it from the original player on the screen. You'll see that now we have two aliens on our screen. However, you'll also notice that these aliens aren't moving and don't respond to keyboard inputs. That's because we have to define it ourselves. If we take a look at the keyboard component that we copied from the starter kit, we'll see that it monitors the key up and key down events to provide us with a Boolean representing the current pressed state of any key. Let's begin by creating a new file to define our controlled game. We can then use the original ES component file for the game as our base component. Next, we'll add an additional child that corresponds to the keyboard component. And finally, We'll add listeners that update the velocity and jump state of the player and the companion based on keyboard inputs from the arrow and WASD keys, respectively. In particular, we'll use the branch keyword on listener configuration objects to specify how we want each Boolean state to be interpreted. If we switch our active demo to this new control version, we'll see that we can now move both characters around independently. As you've seen here, adding controls to a game is pretty simple. And in many cases, particularly when we're designing for people with disabilities, we may find it useful to provide many controllers for the same behavior, something termed multimodality. To create a multimodal control system using voice input, let's create a new file and use our controlled demo as the base. We can grab the button and speak components from our starter kit samples then assign them as children. Importantly, we'll want to use the compose keyword for the button component so that we can easily override its default properties and specify that it should have text showing enable voice commands and an absolute position on the screen. At this point, it's as simple as listening to the button press state with speak.start, as well as triggering the player jump state when the component recognizes that you said the word jump. So now, if we press the enable button and say, jump, we'll see the player respond to our voice commands. And that's all it took with just a few stock components. An important application area for our team at Brains of Play is physiological signals analysis, a domain we continue to push the limits of on the web. As such, we can also define a multimodal control scheme for physiological sensors like electroencephalography or EEG devices, such as the OpenBCI ganglion or the Muse2 headband. This will involve detecting simple states like eye blinks or muscle contractions that we can use to get our character to jump. As a more complicated demo though, it'll be useful to mock this up conceptually before writing additional components. In a new file, we can specify that we want to inherit from our base control application. We can then define the expected children we'll need. First, we'll need a way to access the data from EEG devices. Then, to see what we're getting, we'll want a way to visualize the output as a time series graph. And finally, we'll want a way to convert this continuous data, 
into binary inputs that our game can understand. We'll do this in a very conventional way, using an average calculation and a threshold. Next, we'll want to wire up our listeners. We'll want our player's jump state to be determined by our threshold component. This, in turn, gets input from the average component, which receives input from the output of our device. Since our device may emit data from many recording locations, we'll only want data from the first channel. Using the format keyword on our listener configuration, we can define a function that does just that. Finally, we want our time series graph to respond to our device outputs. Before we test this demo, we'll also make things more stylistically appealing by assigning our time series plot an absolute position and specifying the width and height of its internal canvases. And that's it. Now we can start bringing real components into the mix. This time, we'll use a CDN link to bring in our pre-made time series and device components. Then, we'll import our own average and threshold components, which we'll now define in separate files. The threshold component is pretty simple. All we want to do is determine whether the absolute value of the input is larger than some arbitrary value which we'll specify to a default value of 300. Importantly, this value can be instance specific and changed by the user if we specify it as exported and access it using the this keyword in our default function. The average component isn't much more complicated. We'll simply take in an array input, which we can use the reduce method, on, take the sum of all values, then divide by the array length. Now that we've done this, we can then select our device using the select run button in the top left of the screen. Now, we can get our character to jump simply by blinking or clenching our muscles. In this final section of our tutorial, we'll convert what we've just created together into a robust educational website about ES code and physiological signals. First, let's create a simple UI to house the previous demos. As you've seen before, we can simply import each demo into another ES component file, then specify them as children of this component. Let's then add some basic styling to our components and children, as well as simple text around our demos to make things a bit more interesting. For a bit of practice, let's make this text dynamic. Before our demo and composition, let's have a paragraph that responds to our demo. To do this, We'll have to declare a paragraph separated into several span and EM tags. Then we'll have to declare a listener on our EM tag that listens for changes to our demo input tag. And now, if we save, our tutorial page has some more interesting behavior. The outside text changes based on how our input element has been interacted with. And now, what if we'd like to enhance our physiological signals demo and convert it into a complete tutorial on the topic? Well, we should first define a specific section for this and give it a nice header and additional blocks of content. Then we can mock up our interactive components. So based on the content of this tutorial, we'll want a simple plot of the signal. Next, we'll want to add some noise to it. And then we'll want this piped into a game instance where the player is doing way too much jumping. After, we'll want to show the noisy signal again, but filtered using a low pass filter, and then an additional 50 and 60 hertz notch filter. Finally, we'll want an instance of our game demo where the character can be controlled well using the previous signal as input. Although we have our game component already, which we'll place in the third and sixth blocks, we'll need to create a standalone signal visualization with optional noise filters, as well as some custom listeners that are able to pass the output of the noisy and filtered signal visualization into our games. So let's get started. First, let's create that signal visualization in another component. This will simply involve the time series and device components that we've used before, which we can connect together using a listener. Then, We'll want to create two additional versions, a noisy and a filtered one. Thankfully, we already have a few published components for this. We'll import the filter component into the new file 
as well as our base signal visualization. Then, we'll merge the filter into the signal's device's children, where the result of this merge is also merged into our new component. This will allow us to define some default filters, including a low-pass filter at 40 Hz, a DC block filter, and two notch filters. For our noise file, we'll do the exact same thing, except we'll define default noise frequencies representing power line noise at 50 and 60 Hz, as well as movement noise at 1 Hz. Moving back to our tutorial link, we can import these files and link them in. Now, you'll see that we can connect an EEG headset and see our signal. Since we want some progression between the two filter domains, we'll make sure to turn off the notch filters for the first one. Finally, we want the game demos to receive filtered and noisy device outputs from the signal demos above them. Moreover, it'd be really nice to only connect your device in one location, after which its outputs will be passed to all demos that need them. To do this, we'll programmatically generate our listeners to fulfill these conditions. Essentially, this forwards data from any active demo to all others. Additionally, the outputs of the noisy and second filtered signal demos are specifically forwarded to the phaser demo, and you'll see that this is exactly what happens. Because of this behavior, however, we'll also want to hide the device connections for phaser so only the noisy and filtered data are ever passed. The final trick we have to show for ES Code today is that in addition to textual explanation of demos, we also have an embeddable editor that you can encapsulate any demo with. To add this, we'll have to import the ES Code library from a CDN and add an options object to the arguments of ESCompose.create with a code utility specified, which represents the editor class. Then, we can specify editor properties on each demo we'd like to attach an editor. Now when we save, you'll see that we have editors for each demo. As the name suggests, these are not merely nice visualizations but instead allow you to manipulate your components from the browser. So for instance, we can remove the line connecting our input to the header, and you'll see that this no longer updates. Then we can draw it back in, and you'll see we're now good to go again. We can also allow users to view the text of our components by bundling them to source. To do this, we have to add another utility from the ESMPile library, which specifies how to find the source text. Then, we can specify ESC as a component that can be constructed from a URI source string or an object reference instead of our original reference. Save this and view source files for all of our demos. After this tutorial, I hope you can see the power of using ESCode for building applications. Together, we built a very unique tutorial on ESCode and physiological signals, where an unfiltered and noisy signal becomes increasingly capable of controlling a game with the addition of simple filters. Thanks for watching, and we're excited to see what you develop with us. And now, let's take a look at what some of the funders of ESCode are up to. Here's a clip from the Human Technology Interaction Lab at the University of Alabama. What we're seeing take place here is what we call brain drone racing, where two competitors are put head to head and they're tasked with being able to move a drone using their minds. It's based on uh, EEG data, so that's electrical signals from the brain. We capture those through the devices. The one that we're using is called the Muse. They could be focusing on a movie they, they watched last night. They could be focusing on math, doing math on their heads. Having a background in music, um, and specifically piano, I typically think about pieces that I've played before um, or pieces of music that I'm really familiar with. Being able to now pilot a drone with the Muse headset, it's kind of like everything's come full circle.